We're starting a new series today entitled, I Will Dwell Among Them. It's a six-part series. The first two parts are going to give reverence to the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. The second two messages are going to give reverence to the temple of Solomon. And the third uh, two messages are going to be about the church of the Lord Jesus, which is the Bible calls the temple of God. And today, the main emphasis is for us to realize how much our Heavenly Father longs to dwell among us and that we get that revelation and that there's something to be said about that, having God dwell among you. And I think that it is so important that we maybe recapture this. When I was a young boy in the 60s, you would not go to church without being properly dressed. It's just not possible because that was the culture. I mean, the culture in society, at least in the Netherlands, you know, on Sunday, you honestly saw nobody go anywhere except to go to church. And we would go dressed up because we went to the house of God and we showed honor and reverence to the house of God. And we would be um, reverential. Yeah, almost like the word austere, but that can have a different meaning nowadays. In other words, you wouldn't mock about it. You wouldn't make light about it. And I think we need to recapture the holiness of coming together as God's people. And we need to realize how powerful it is to have him dwell in us and among us. And that is what attracts the world. What attracts the world to come to church is because God's people are holy and because God dwells among us. And the people see a bright light. Jesus said the church should be like a city set on the hill that overshadows the whole city or town. Jesus said we as individuals should be like bright shining lights that men may be able to see God and his works and glorify him. There should be something about us that people go, what is this about you? What is that smile? What is that friendliness? Well, the, I don't know how to describe it, but, and then you say, it's the presence of Jesus in my heart. He's come to live in me by his spirit. I've become the house of God, and he wants to come and dwell with you too. And that should be normal talk to us. That should be matter of fact. That's the elementary of Christianity. That's the basics of Christianity. And that's why we say, me and my house will serve the Lord. Because he dwells with us and among us. Amen? So, our main scripture for the six messages is right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 16, 17, and 18. And what agreement, remember this statement for a bit later, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what's unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Wow, what a phenomenal promise to have. Then we go a couple of pages to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and I would like you to just see the end. And the reason I feel to show you this is to emphasize the importance, to emphasize what it means to God. I think that we can all stand the risk that we live in the shadow, murky feelings of what we want, what we need. And we're not always living in the bright light of what God wants and what God needs. But what God wants, my friends, is what is best for us. What He wants is best for us. There is nothing better than to have the Lord with you, in you. 
If God be for us, who could be against us? When you have the Lord on your side to fight your battles for you, to give you courage and strength, to comfort you in the time of mourning, of sorrow, of misunderstanding, of betrayal, of hurt, and you say, Lord, if it wasn't you, if it wasn't for you, I would have been consumed alive. And that you have the Lord. And I want you to see here in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. You know, there's been lots of talk about the earth deteriorating. Right? And I know that people have ideas how they're going to stop that. But we know that this earth will pass away. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we know that that's coming. And perhaps the signals are starting to arise on the horizon of creation to say the time is growing near. Be ready for the coming of the Lord. And what I think is interesting, that in the new heaven and the earth, there was no more sea. Wow. How much land we'll have to live on if there's no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold! The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Oh, glory to God when you know you're part of that new creation because its life is living in you by the Holy Spirit. And we know what is the highlight of the new heaven and the new earth is God dwelling among us. And so I want you to see that this is right to the root of God's nature, His desire. And this is what He looks for. And this is what he wants. And this is what he has done everything for, to be able to dwell among us. So if we go to the book of Exodus, please. The book of Genesis, you have 50 little chapters there. And these are the beginnings. And there's only one reference to holiness in the whole book of Genesis, in all those 50 chapters, only one little reference and that is that God rested on the seventh day in all that he had made, and he hallowed the seventh day. He made it holy. And the point of that statement there, which is giving an indication of where God is going in having created everything, it is where he dwells, becomes holy, because only he is holy. Uh, Wayne, do me a favor, turn me up just a little. I, I, I keep feeling I'm not there. And God wants us to realize that it is impossible. God wants you and me to realize that it is impossible to have God dwell among us and us not be holy. It's not possible. Why? Because He is holy. <laughs> and holiness is the height of the combination of all God is. It is the glory of who He is and what He is. He is holy. He is totally perfectly holy in love and righteousness, perfected in the manifestation of Himself. And the Bible says there's none holy but the Lord. So in the book of Genesis, you see the Lord prepared a way. And the book of Genesis ends with the story of Joseph, I, uh, Jacob, and the whole family, 70 of them, arriving in Egypt, where they were going to be, according to the word of the Lord, for 400 years. 
and then they would be t- brought out by God's mighty hand and enter into the land God had promised to give to them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all of these things, and there's so much in it, if you have Holy Ghost anointed eyes, it will open the scripture to you that you go, my goodness, oh God, you know everything from the beginning to the end. You know anything and everything. Nothing has happened despite everything that we've gone through where you were not ordering the way. Now, anybody who reads the book of Genesis and sees, for example, the dysfunction in Abraham's family's life, Isaac's family's life, Esau, Jacob, how can God still fulfill his word through all of that dysfunction. And you see, you can say somebody is amazing until they have to go through impossible things, until they have to wrestle through things that are so dysfunctional that without supernatural intervention, nothing good will come from it. And the reason why I bring that up, everybody sitting here has experienced dysfunction in one way or another in your upbringing. Do not let that stop God from fulfilling his good will for your life. Because God will use the not mighty, not noble, and not so wise to humble the wise and noble and mighty in their own eyes to show that if it wasn't for the Lord, we'd have nothing. It is the Lord. It is the Lord. It is the Lord. Say it. Oh, hallelujah, when you begin to feel it is the Lord who is in charge of my life. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how it's possible, but I know with God nothing is impossible, I believe. Oh, how good it is to have faith against hope, in hope that what God has spoken, he will fulfill. And what he has said, he will do it. Oh, what a good thing when you can say in the end, his word is true and it works in my life. Praise the Lord when you have that spirit of faith, which is what is introduced to us in the book of Genesis. Then the book of Exodus begins with this opening of God's bosom, where he meets Moses on the mountain and says, Moses, Moses, Take the shoes off of your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And you get a revelation of what holiness is when the bush has been assimilated in the fire. And you begin to realize what cannot be assimilated will be consumed. And that is the power of holiness. What cannot become one with the holiness will be consumed by the holiness. And you begin to realize to have God dwelling in us and among us, we have to be assimilated, become one with his holiness, or will be consumed by it. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I believe today God doesn't want anybody to be consumed by it that you get so uncomfortable in the presence of the Lord that you go, I don't know why, I, don't, I can't be there anymore, I can't be there anymore. Well, what's wrong? I don't know. And you feel within you the rebellion against the knowledge of the Lord. You feel within you the rebellion against the holiness of God. No, don't run away. Fall on your face and say, have mercy upon me, O God. Have mercy. <laughs> don't run away. Amen. Say amen. amen. Moses didn't run away. Moses didn't run away. He didn't say, well, I'm not taking my shoes off. I'm not doing that. No, he took his shoes off. And he stood on holy ground. And he became one with the holiness of God. And God says, I've seen it. I've heard it. I've remembered my promise. And I've come down. And Moses said, well, I'm not ready. And God says, I'm ready. You're ready. Because my readiness is your readiness. Come on, folks. Nobody is truly ready for the holiness of God. Honestly, every one of us can say, I've got a few things I I need sorted in my nature, in my character, in my attitude, to my responses, in my ways of thinking and talking. But when God is ready, 
He makes us ready. He is the one that makes holy. He is the one that makes holy. And I'll show you, before we go to Exodus, a scripture here in Leviticus. Leviticus. Oh, I love these scriptures. I love them with all my heart. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26, listen to it. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. Wow. Have you ever thought about who you belong to? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? You ever think about it? If somebody would say, who do you belong to? Right? Who do you belong to? And what are they looking for? What kind of answer? You know, people hear my accent, even though I've lived in this country, we've lived here for 36 years. And people say, are you on holiday? <laughs> it's a bit of a long holiday. I should kind of say, oh yeah, I've been on holiday for the last 36 years. <laughs> With my girlfriend. <laughs> She's really hot. Yeah. I went out and married her, but anyway. No. Who do you belong to? Am I Dutch? Are you English? Are you African? Are you Greek? My Greek friend there. Are you Zimbabwe? Are you Nigeria? Are you Canada? Are you Russia? Are you... We have all these people sitting here. And I know so many others, so forgive me that I didn't mention yours. We have Ukrainian people sitting here. How is that possible? We could sit in the same church from India. What are you? I belong to God. He owns me. I'm his, and he is mine. My beloved is mine, and I'm his. That's what the Lord says, that you should be mine. That's the whole glory of belonging to God. And here in Deuteronomy, he says in chapter 7, verse 6, You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. You may not always feel special, but you are when you belong to God as your father and you are his child. Yes, how amazing. And you may say, Pastor Robert, what has that got to do with the tabernacle of Moses? Well, that's the whole point of the tabernacle of Moses. Let's start at verse 25, please. In verse 25, Moses is on top of the mountain with the leadership team. Hur is there, Aaron is there, Joshua is there, and they're sitting before the Lord. No, listen closely. They're sitting before the Lord. They've come out of Egypt by God's mighty hand with great signs and wonders and miracles. They've come out of the land of bondage. They have been led to this mountain of the Lord where God had said to Moses when he saw the burning bush, Moses, this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. You will serve me on this mountain. <laughs> I love that about God. That's like God saying, go ahead, dare me. You're going to be back here serving me. I'm going to conquer all your foes. I'm going to conquer all your enemies. I am going to bring you back here with all of my people and nobody can stop me. I love it when God stands up and puts his foot down. Don't you? It's about time we see the Lord stand up again and put his Holy Ghost feet down. And don't you know we are his feet? And here the Lord stands up and he says that. And now Moses is back and he's sitting before the Lord and they're eating together. Yes? And the Lord God is manifesting himself. Oh, you should read it. It is so glorious. God is manifesting himself. He is with them while they're having the meal. And then the Lord says to Moses, Moses, come up on the mountain with me and leave them in charge down here. Leave her and Aaron in charge. And if anybody has any 
questions what to do, let them go to them. You come and be up with me. And I like it that Joshua was always close behind. If you want to get ready for what God has for you, stay close behind. Stay close behind. Joshua was close behind. He wasn't where Moses was, but he wasn't far away either. But he surely wasn't where Aaron and her were. Come on. You have to sometimes choose whom you're going to serve with the rest of your life. And here, Moses is on the mountain. Listen now. For six days, he's just there in the presence of God, doing nothing. Some of us do not yet have the temperament that God is looking for that he's trying to work in you. Listen closely. One of the temperaments God's looking for in us as a congregation, wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. I'm serious. (laughs) It is something that God works in you. Wait upon me. Trust me. Rely upon me. Yeah, but Lord, yeah, but Lord, that is what needs to stop. The yabba, yabba, yabba. You need to just be still. Just be still. And know I'm God, and I will be hollowed. And yabba, yabba, yabba. Uh, uh, the arguing. Yeah, but why not? And uh, why not now? And, and Lord, I'm, 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 and that all that impatience is unbelief. And all that impatience is the unholy nature. And God is saying, lay it down. Rest in me. Trust in me. Rely on me. And on the seventh day, the glory of the Lord came all over Moses. And God spoke to him. And this is what he said. <laughs> Exodus 25, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skin, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and on the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. (laughs) Right? Here the Lord, and this is very important, he is giving Moses a revelation of what God needs to be able to dwell among them and not be separate from them, to dwell among them. He's giving Moses a revelation. Moses is getting a vision of what it would mean to live a heavenly life on earth as we are called to pray, Father, in heaven, as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. And he's getting a revelation, right? And while Moses is getting the revelation of what God needs to be able to dwell among us, what are the people doing? Hmm? They're making a golden calf. They're making a golden calf. (laughs) They went to Aaron and her, and they say, whatever happened to this Moses... It's been 40 days, 40 nights, we haven't heard a thing. That's not that long to wait, is it? Come on now. That's just a little over a month waiting. But they were fed up with waiting. And they said, make us gods. (laughs) And, And he said, well, take all these jewelry that you use to kind of act spiritual. I know that maybe sounds strange, but in those days, they had nose rings, ear rings, feet rings, and other kinds of rings that made them act, they were spiritual. I know that is strange, but it's true. But not Holy Ghost spiritual. You see, sometimes we have an imagination of what it means to be holy. We have an imagination of what it means to be spiritual. But God doesn't dwell in the imagination. God dwells in the spirit. (laughs) And he does not want us to live on the imagination, but he wants us to live in the spirit. And yes, your imagination is almost like a, a picture screen of the television in which you may get an image. But God does not live in imagination. He lives in the spirit. And he wants us to live in the spirit. 
and the imagination that they had was completely messed up by what they had lived in in Egypt and what they had carried along from beyond Egypt, from beyond the river, from Abraham and the others. There's quite a lot of depth about some of these statements and I can't go into explaining all that. And they lived within all of these imaginations. What am I trying to say to you with this? When God comes to dwell among us, he says, we do need to clean house. We do need to clean heart. We do need to clean mind. Because some of your ways of looking at me isn't me. Some of your ways of acting isn't me. Some of your ways talking isn't me. And I personally do not want to live in a crooked way when God would have me straight. How about you? I don't want to live in my feelings and thoughts about it when that isn't the truth. David prayed in Psalm 25, lead me in your truth, O God. Your word is truth. (laughs) Friends, God wants to bring us into a realization of the truth And the tabernacle that God instructed Moses to build was to bring people into the knowledge of the truth of himself, to unveil to them his holiness. There was one other thing that I want to say, and we'll talk about it some more next week, and that is the priest and the tabernacle. You see, in the tabernacle, you had the priest, and the priest was dressed with nine pieces of clothing. In 1989, the year we started this church, I was having a crusade in Canterbury at the Marlow Theatre, and I went to Birmingham to have lunch with Brother Reinhard Bunke. And I'm sitting at the table where I was told to wait for him, and he comes in, and I stand up to greet him, and he says, Robert, Robert, did you know that the high priest wore nine pieces of clothing when he went into the Holy of Holies. I said, nine? No, I didn't know that. He said, and did you know one piece of clothing the Lord said, if you don't wear it in my presence, you'll die. What piece of clothing do you think that would be? I said, I have no idea. He said, linen underwear. (laughs) Linen underwear. So I'm waiting for the punchline, right? I mean, what's the spiritual message that I'm getting from God here, from this holy man of God that's now in heaven, Brother Bunky? He said, Robert, live holy before the Lord. In your private life, live holy, Robert, because when the high priest came into the presence of the Lord and the glory of God began to manifest as he poured that blood on the mercy seat, the stones representing the tribes of Israel came alive. And when he came out of that holy of holies to greet the people, they all knew the blessing of the Lord had come upon them and they began to worship God. Oh, Robert, the nations are waiting to see the presence of the Lord. Live holy, Robert. Live holy, Robert. You see, the temple, the tabernacle was all to introduce us to what it means to live holy. And we're going to talk some more about it next week. And I will close with this one little thought. The high priest, out of the nine pieces of clothing, had one other piece that I want to mention to you. On his forehead, he had a golden plate engraved with the letters, Holiness to the Lord. He had it on his forehead. It's where your reasoning takes place. And the reason he had that on his forehead, and you can read about it in Exodus 36, is that when he would walk into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of the Lord, listen, he would carry the iniquity of the holy things, the scripture says. And I've always wondered for years and years, There is no iniquity in holiness. What does that mean? He carried the iniquity of the holy things into the presence of the Lord. 
what does that mean, Lord? What does that mean? And one day the Holy Spirit opened my understanding and showed me what it meant. That the high priest represented the people coming into God's presence and where the people were still falling short in their devotion, in their consecration, in their dedication, where they were still compromising, where they were still indifferent, where they were still idle in their worship. <laughs> their nature wasn't totally right yet. He, through His holiness, made them acceptable before God so that they would not be rejected but would be accepted. The high priest's holiness is what made the people holy. And when I saw that, Ephesians 1 verse 7 came alive. We have been made accepted in the beloved according to the riches of the glory of His grace. And we have such a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has not entered the tabernacle of Moses, but the true tabernacle in heaven for you and me, so that we can be holy because He is holy. Shall we all stand together? The symbolism of the tabernacle of Moses is phenomenal, and we'll talk about it next week. <coughs> it won't be boring, trust me. But you know God is calling you, and that's why you're here today. He's calling you. And he's saying, listen, I want to dwell. I want to dwell with you and in you. I want you to dwell with me. That's why you were made. That's why I gave you the body, so that I could come and live in you by my spirit. Your body has been purchased with the blood of Jesus to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God's calling you. And the Lord may look at some of us and say, you're a bit indifferent. You're okay. You're okay with just enough not to go to hell. <laughs> but I want you to have much more than just barely saved. I want you to become holy, filled and flooded with my presence and be a witness that I am your God and Father and you are my son and daughter. I need you. The world is in darkness and people don't know where to go for help. I'm calling you. Come, says the Lord, and I will dwell in you and I will be a God to you and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. And if you say, oh Lord, I need to get straightened out. I've been empty. Put your hand on your heart. If you know the way you're living is not right in God's sight, and you say, please, Jesus, save me, cleanse me, wash me, regenerate me, make me new, Lord. I surrender my life to you today. Pray this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all my sins and I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me in your precious blood. Wash me white as snow and come and live in my heart by your Holy Spirit. I'm yours, Jesus. Save me. And Father, I pray for all of us today that we hear your call from heaven. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And I will dwell among you. I will dwell in you. And you shall be mine, my people. And I will be your God and your Father. And you shall be my sons and daughters and Father, I pray right now for your Holy Spirit's presence to fill and flood each and every one of us. And that every day from this week, we say, oh Lord, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours, Lord. Thank you for claiming me as your own. Thank you for buying me with the precious blood. Thank you for filling me with your presence and power. I'm yours, Lord. And the Lord bless you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. And everybody says, I love you. Keep coming. Come and join me if you can on Wednesday, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. And then I'll look forward to see you next Sunday, second part of this series. Have a good day, everybody. Enjoy the nice weather. <laughs>